podcast. I'm your host, Hallie Dye. Um, We are so excited you're here with us today, whether it's your first time or your 55th time. Um, But today we have on the podcast, Reeves Walker. Welcome to the podcast. What's up? I'm happy to be here. Thanks so much for coming on. I know you're super busy, so we really appreciate um, you coming. Well, we always start our episodes with who is Reeves Walker for people who know you or don't or don't know everything about you. Yeah. Well, My name is Reeves Walker. Uh, I'm married to Lydia Dozier because she hasn't changed her name. And uh, I'm pretty sure it took me a year or two. It's to that. okay. There's like a hundred hoops for her to jump through, so I've They're tried to really help her, hard. and I, so it's just going to be a little bit. That's a real but, thing. It'll happen um, eventually. I am currently a uh, I I own a lawn care business, and so I do that and. I'm also a real estate agent with your brother and brother-in-law. I mean, your husband like, and brother-in-law. <laughs> News to me. <laughs> your but husband like, oh, yeah, and brother-in-law. But Micah, but yeah. um, and uh, that's a new thing. I'm about two months in, learning from them, and uh, yeah. awesome getting to work with them and um, build relationships with them. And, Are you uh, able to get any work done? Yeah. With them yeah, yeah, there? yeah. Yeah, they're great. They're great. Uh, they've mm. been awesome and uh, just awesome kind of new friendships i knew micah yeah um a long time ago but so yeah i do that um and yeah. lead worship at north monroe and yeah for Ella worship and mm-hmm. so whatever good, else the, the lord brings my way <laughs> yeah exactly i get that so much well see that is exactly what i mean you're very busy that's a lot yeah. uh i mean and still kind of newlyweds how long have y'all been married yeah a year and about four months yeah so. that counts so you know actually yesterday oh wow yeah <laughs> it's hard to keep track of the month oh i, yeah. I thought going That's in hard. i was like this is gonna be you know yeah we'll remember every time go to, but i'm not the best <laughs> at remembering but neither I'm is impressed she so. that you yeah i don't even know if we did that in fact i'm like is it 12 or 13 years coming <laughs> up yeah it's 13 um so reeves did you grow up in baton rouge Yes. Okay. So I was born in Monroe, and then we moved to Baton Rouge when I was about five years old. Okay. And I grew up there. Okay. So I didn't I didn't leave Baton Rouge until 2017. Okay, gotcha. What was life like growing up in Baton Rouge? What did your childhood look like? Yeah, the um. I mean, I like I have a ton of happy memories. Um, mm-hmm. Baton Rouge. Uh, it's a really cool place, honestly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, over time, uh, it was overall pretty tough just because of life circumstances. Um, my parents ended up getting divorced when I was about eight or nine. And yeah. and the whole point of moving to Baton Rouge was just job-related for them. And right. um, so his parents didn't live there. Her parents didn't live there. We were kind of just like our first as a family we were like out on our own yeah um which is hard yeah well like as far as them and their parents and their sides of the family and uh and so the they had troubles and then so they split and so for a while it was it was you know it had its times where it's rough and good um but they were both pretty active all the way up through they were both pretty, both active in mm-hmm. me and my brother's life. I have right. one sibling. Um, yeah. He's three years younger than me. Yeah. And so through that, um, we just, we we had, we had went through different school systems. First mm-hmm. it was Episcopalian school, mm-hmm. you know, first through fifth grade, or um, really like kindergarten through fifth yeah. grade, and, uh, and then Catholic school from sixth grade to mm-hmm. through high school. Did you grow up Catholic? Or no. Is that, that was just so a that's like a very interesting thing about my childhood because it was just very different. Mm. Um, the culture of just that type of school and that church yeah. community, it's just very different than um, yeah. Protestant And like, was that churches. kind of your view of church at that time in your life? Well, I mean, I, I, I grew up in a Christian home. Yeah. I didn't say that at the beginning. Yeah. And um, like when we lived in... 
when we lived in Monroe until yeah. I was five, my parents were plugged into WFR Church, which is mm-hmm. a Church of Christ Church here. Yeah. Um, which is now denomination now non denominational. And um that'll come back later in the story, but Yeah. Um so I was raising a really good Christian home mm-hmm. and then obviously going to Catholic school was very different. Even right. Episcopal school was different. Um yeah. just very liturgical and like mm-hmm. we had to go to um, mass and sit still. Chapel yeah. at, at Episcopal school and, and mass at Catholic school, which is very similar, honestly. Yeah. But uh, it was just different. It yeah. was very different. So it definitely, if it, I would say it probably affected my view mm. of church and the Christian life. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, through that, I, I just got, it was just very different upbringing. Yeah. yeah. Um, How would you say your personal relationship with the Lord was like, say, high school? Do you feel like it was there, kind of going through the motions? Yeah, so that's kind of like the, I feel like, I think it's Matthew 7, um, where it talks about the narrow and the wide gates. Mm -hmm. And when I share my story, I like to talk about that verse because the whole thing that I was going through in high school was figuring out how, what that relationship with God meant to me and how that was going to play out in my life. And so in the school year, I was with the wrong group of friends all Mm -hmm. year and, um, Every summer, I'd come back to West Monroe, yeah. and I would stay with John Luke and Sadie, and and mm-hmm. go to Camp Chioka, which is a big camp here, yeah, uh, Christian camp. And every summer, I would go to camp as a camper, and then stay and work as junior staff, and and work at Duck Commander, and like just do whatever I could to spend the whole summer. Like I would yeah. spend like anywhere from a month to three months here, right? Just be immersed in it, yeah. Yeah, and here, it's just a com- like from Catholic school and mm-hmm. Baton Rouge and the people that we were surrounded by there yeah. um, to, to this was just polar opposites. Yeah. And so every summer I would come here and be on this spiritual high and I would feel like I knew who the Lord was and I, I knew that a relationship with him was important. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would like be almost walking it out in the summer, but then as soon as I got home, yeah. it was just, it never stuck. Yeah. And I mean, obviously like, our relationship with the Lord, like I can remember learning in college, because I feel like college is where most people like take um, ownership of their faith, because yeah. it's like, well, my parents aren't making me go to church or whatever, you know, you, you, I mean, I went to LSU as well, which we'll get to in your story. And so it's like, nobody's telling me to get up and go to church. You know, you have right. to decide that for yourself. Um, but there's also a huge part of community. And, and so I'm curious, like, how do you view your community now? What kind of like weight do you put in the people that surround you now that you have walked that like distinction where the summers look this way, but going back to the school year looked a different way. Yeah. I think now I understand the importance of that where I did not in high school. I just was struggling with the, it was like a teeter totter and and I was just going opposite end of the spectrum and then Mm. fully opposite again, like just every year. And, um, I just wouldn't, I never would figure that out until yeah. about 2017, like yeah. middle of college. Yeah. So tell us, because I'm excited to get to that part of your story, but tell us about, you started at LSU, correct? Yeah. We had talked about that. Um, did you just decide LSU because it's close? No. <clears throat> um, so, well, this is interesting. Uh, so me and John Luke stayed super close. I mean, mm-hmm. he was my best friend and yeah. still is to this day. And um, we, throughout each summer that I spent with him, like we would start talking about college. Mm-hmm. And originally John Luke was like, I want to go to Harding. His parents went to Harding. I knew about Harding. Everybody, I, like tons of people here right. go to Harding. Yeah. Um, Christian College in uh, Searcy, Arkansas. And uh so I was like, okay, I mean, I like, I really, as a senior in high school, I knew like, this is about to be the, where the rubber hits the road. Like if I don't make the right decision, I knew mm. like in my heart of hearts, like yeah. this is going to be where I decide what I'm like, Yeah. which is like really cool to think about me really thinking that far it ahead, is, but, yeah. I, but sad cause I didn't make the right decision, but mm. Um, so we went and visited Harding and, um, we were going to room together and it looked like we were going to go there. I had a scholarship. Um, wow. it was a smaller academic scholarship, but I had a good enough ACT score and, um, 
and there was like a money thing like just it was, it's not a cheap school so mm. it was like ah, it's gonna be tight but my mom was like so super safe. happy that yeah. i wanted to go to a christian school she's like yeah. we'll figure it out i mean you've got the scholarship right so i was pretty excited i was ready to go to harding yeah and uh then john luke was like oh, i want to go see the school of liberty mm. do you want to go and i was like yeah i guess what happened to harding you know? <laughs> So I went with him, yeah. not really like sure. I just, I was like, I don't know if I want to go to Lynchburg, Virginia. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I just don't, I just did, I was very unsure. Yeah. So we went and visited and um, we were hosted by awesome people and mm-hmm. visited and, and went to convocation and mm-hmm. just pretty much toured everything, saw what it looks like to be a student at Liberty. And I loved it. Um but I think ultimately, and I think I ended up telling my mom this later, like, I think my mom wanted me to do it. She wanted to figure it out, which is even, if you don't know, Liberty's even more expensive. It's mm-hmm. very, um, very popular Christian school. And, yeah. uh, tuition's pretty high yeah. for most families, I would say. But um, I just, I think I just was aware of how high it was and I yeah. didn't want to. Put that stress on your yeah. mom. Yeah. And I, I, I and I think that there's, you know, there was a spiritual battle going on there. Like sure. I was fighting with my flesh and I was like, well, maybe this is just going to make it easier for me to just go to LSU. Yeah. And so. Um, Before we get to, to your part of LSU, is there a part of you that's grateful for the hardship that you walked through because it paved way for you to take ownership of your faith? Whereas like, do you think, do you think there's a part of you that's like, if I would have just gone with John Luke, would it have been John Luke's faith by extension or would it have been mine? Yeah. I mean, I think there's, I think that that's, you know, as we walk with the Lord, we know that <clears throat> we like the saying hindsight's twenty twenty. I mean, we yeah. can look back and we can decide to embrace what we've walked through or we can be ashamed of it. And yeah. Obviously, like I had to learn to just accept and embrace, you know, what the Lord has brought me through, yeah. you know, to this day and, and know that it makes me who I am today. And so on that side of things, I'm, I'm grateful, but there are days Ooh, that I have it. looked back and been yeah. like, man, it probably would have been way different. Right. Um, and maybe that's good and bad to, to your point. Like right. maybe I would have just been like dragged along going mm-hmm. that route and, yeah. um, you know, I say that knowing that the Lord knew exactly what um, yeah. he had planned for me. Not that he chose that for me. Mm-hmm. I chose what I ended up deciding to do, and it wasn't right. necessarily the right best thing for me. But, um, yeah. you know, he turns all things for good. Like, right. We know he's- well, and I was thinking about when you were talking about that. Um, obviously, he gives us choice, and he gives us free will, which sometimes we wish he wouldn't. You know? yeah. um, sometimes we're like, please tell me what it is that you want me to do here. But I know also one of the verses that you mentioned that was big to you is Jeremiah 29, 11. Yeah. And it's like, yes, we have choice, and he does use all things for our good, but he also knows the plans that he has for you, mm-hmm. plans to prosper and not to harm. You know. Yeah. And I love that verse because I think sometimes, you know, some verses can be quoted so many times that you're like, forget the power of them you yeah. know what i mean like it's and that's definitely one that's quoted all the time it feels yeah. like a cliche verse and but for me that's i'll never not carry that verse with me because right. in the lifestyle that i was living at lsu when i got into college yeah that was the only verse i could remember mm. like it's so cliche that that's like if i thought of a scripture yeah well, every once in a blue moon in yeah. that lifestyle I was in, that was the one. And like my mom had given me stuff that had that um, verse on it. And yeah. so like if I had anything in my house or had any thought that yeah. was at all towards the Lord and mm-hmm. um, where I should be and what my relationship should be with him, yeah, um, that was like the verse that would come to my mind. So that was like, you know, I don't, this is what I remember and I feel lost right now. I don't really know how this verse plays out in my life. I don't really know what it means for me. But yeah. this is the verse I remember. So yeah. I don't know. It is something I've carried. Absolutely. Well, I love that you said like, yeah, it does sound cliche, but it really was like the only sustenance I had because like, it doesn't matter how much a verse is quoted. Like it holds power. It's active and alive. Like it's actually the sustenance that we 
live on as believers, you know, and it's like, what a, what a tool of the enemy to make something seem cliche, you know, or like commonplace Exactly. and like, you know, God's word says like the heavens and the earth will pass away, but my word never shall, you know, and it's like, that's our foundation. I love that. So going into that, what did that season look like at LSU? Um, yeah, I, high school really, the it it really had already started because I had found just the wrong group of friends as far as you know my tendencies and there's a lot about my like even my family past with uh, alcohol that goes really far back that I didn't know mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh, mm-hmm. so I really had gotten into a lot of really bad stuff in high school. And so when I got to LSU, it just like it just opened up the floodgates even more. Yeah. Um, so I joined a fraternity and uh, and just did that whole lifestyle. Pretty much dove in head first to it, and yeah. like you know, kind of like you said earlier, it's that's really a big point where people figure out how what their relationship with God really looks like for themselves. Right. You get away from your parents, you move out on your own, and mm-hmm. and in all other aspects of life, you're you don't live with your parents anymore. You. Mm. You have to, I mean, my my mom was giving me, like, some money, and then I was kind of like, I had to get, you know, I had to work and figure mm-hmm. out how I need, how I can get other spending money, and right. if I wasn't going to live in the dorm, eventually, what, how was I going to save up for rent, and there, all the things, and uh, yeah. so I, I mean, very quickly, I got kicked out of my dorm in the first semester, mm. I think might have been the second and then somehow got into another one well I moved home for a little bit and then Mm. my mom had actually gotten remarried when I was a senior in high school okay so that was a new element of our family and um, new dynamic and so me coming home was awful Mm because I had already like that point where you hit 18 it's like I'm not doing what you tell me to do and now I come home with that Right. And then it was just, it just made matters worse. and A lot of tension. You know, my, yeah. My brother was three years younger than me, and so he's watching this too. He's in high school. Right. And um, so that didn't last very long. I ended up somehow getting into another dorm, like I said. And uh, mm-hmm. it was just like a repeat over and over again. I mean, I, like roommates never worked out. They ended up getting me in a part. They, they moved to West Monroe. Yeah. And my brother went to OCS and they got me an apartment and my stepdad still kind of worked in Baton Rouge. So it was a two bedroom apartment that he comes stay in Mm -hmm. and I would just live there. Yeah. And that made up the whole sophomore year at LSU. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So eventually I just came to this breaking point, um, and to be more specific, it was just, I was going out every night. I had mm. a real alcohol problem. I mm. wanted to drink every single day. Yeah. Um, and I learned later that that was a numbing uh, sure. remedy. Yeah. And uh, also just surrounding. Uh, yeah. There, in a fraternity, the problem is there's always something to do, especially at a school like LSU. Like right. there's always, if you join a fraternity at a school that, has that kind of party culture. There's always people going out. There's always something to get involved with. Yeah. And I found it every night. I sought it out. Yeah. And so I ended up getting, I picked up an addiction to Xanax and, you know, everything beneath that as well. And yeah. uh, it was just every day. Yeah. And do you think that's more common in the party scene at, in colleges than people realize? maybe I mean I think you know it was once I got there it was I I had already gotten a pretty good understanding of how much that was involved in the scene I was about to walk into going to LSU yeah um I think looking back it's definitely more than what people know yeah Uh, I mean it's everywhere yeah but I think that's probably at a lot of other schools. Oh, yeah, I mean, for sure. I don't know that that's just LSU. Right, yeah. But. Um, 
How did your lifestyle at that point, I'm sure there felt like distance between you and the Lord because we've all walked through seasons where we know we're not following his ways. You know, we know we're not walking closely with him, but how did what you were walking through and the darkness that you were experiencing affect the way you thought he saw you? Yeah, I think that he just wanted nothing to do with me. I I thought that. Yeah. As I was living that way and Yeah. Um at my lowest moments cuz amidst all that I'm severely depressed. Yeah. Um definitely having suicidal thoughts. Uh, never acted on that, but didn't really know, I I knew that I was aware of these thoughts but didn't really know what to do with them. Yeah. Um and when I would think about the Lord, I just was like, Oh, he does not approve of any of this. So Mm -hmm. it was just like a very ashamed, um, perspective and, um, really picture of God, like that. He's just angry at me. Mm. So it was hard for me to, at some, I remember there were a couple of my lowest moments where I just opened the Bible I had and tried and Mm. just had no idea like what, where to start? Yeah, what like to do. I like I grew up hearing these words, a lot of these verses yeah. I recognized, and I was like, yeah, I just don't know what this means for my life because I, I mean, I guess the viewpoint was I've just already screwed it up, you know, yeah. I'm too far gone. I think sometimes too, like to your point, um, obviously everyone has shame and darkness in their past because at some point we weren't saved, right? Right. Um, and but I think. I don't want to say like it's worse or it's harder by any means because everyone has hardships. Um, But like I think to the point that you just said, sometimes when you've grown up in church, it's almost like this like double portion of shame because you're like, I knew. Yeah. I knew better. And so like, and he knows I knew. And so like he's going to have no forgiveness for me now, you know, Mm -hmm. versus someone who's like, well, I've never heard the truth, you know. And I think there's this shame of like, I knew better and I did it anyway, you know, kind of thing. And like that sometimes can just like in our minds and in our conscience drop a further wedge, even though he's near, you know, yeah. and that's not how he sees us. Um, for the person who finds themselves feeling that way about themselves right now and thinks that's how the Lord views them, you know, because it's kind of like, well, I've already done this. I can't go back now. Yeah. You know what I mean? What have you found to be true about the Lord? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> you know, I can look back now that I understand, like, the heart of the the Father and the love that He has for us. Um, just now that I've walked with Him for six years, which I've said this before, I, I consider myself very young in my faith, so I, like, I say that to say I'm still very much learning yeah what does this look like day to day and season to season it's just right. like new challenges and you have to figure out how am I going to walk with Christ every single day and right. um now that I have some of that under my belt mm-hmm. when I look back I recognize the moments where he was just like really trying to show me that hey I yeah. don't think that way about you yeah and yeah. I think that that's hard to recognize if you're not, if you don't know how to look for that, um, you, you don't know that it's him. Yeah. It's really just when we look back, yeah, we see how faithful he was that, you know, we could have, we never could have strayed off too far. Mm -hmm. Even if we thought at that time we did. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, if you're, in that position and you're able to muster up the ability to listen to somebody that's not yeah in the lifestyle that you're in maybe you don't feel like they can even relate to you right if you can find a way to listen to what they're saying the lord is reaching out and calling after you Mm -hmm. and chasing after you yeah but you have to look for it and Mm -hmm. i'll give an example um you know one of the things that happened was I decided that I, I had gotten really bad off into addiction into Xanax and I was like, you know, I need money and I'm f- trying to fuel this problem I have. This is all subconscious, but yeah, 
I was like, I'll just sell Xanax. I'll mm-hmm. just get a large amount and sell it, and then I can use it whenever I want to. Um, and uh, so I got some from somebody I knew. And this is 11 o'clock in the morning. Like, I got out of class, and I had been thinking about it, decided I was going to do it, texted him, got it. Like, whenever to get it. And, you know, this is like, I don't know when you could start, whenever the cloud came, you could start, you could see text messages from your, like, Apple account. I I don't know. Yeah. Yeah how to when that came along or how to really explain that but at Mm -hmm. this point you could do that and i wasn't thinking about that Mm -hmm. but my parents my mom throughout this like lifestyle that was the the, the whole journey Mm -hmm. she had just real moments of like discernment like a mother's discernment that you hear about that's like almost seems like kind of mythical but yeah. like well it is probably supernatural it is, yeah <laughs> it is super yeah. yeah at the time that's what it was to me <laughs> but she like it would just frustrate me because yeah. she would just know like yeah. when i was in trouble and she had she like was i mean it's in the middle of the day she's working yeah. and she just has this feeling come over her that i'm in trouble yeah and at this point they live in west monroe right. i'm in baton rouge i'm a sophomore and so she goes to my stepdad. It's like, I've, I have the feeling again, you know, and this is a tension point in their relationship. Like he's like, you know, we have somewhat of a relationship. Right. And, you know, he's trying to figure out how does he try to influence me in the right direction, not being my biological father. Right. And, uh, yeah, it's hard. So he checks my text messages and, when I tell you, I, I was like, I, w- I knew they could check the text messages. Yeah. But the very fact that it was 11 o'clock in the morning, I was like, they're not going to be looking at it right now. I'm fine. I'm going to communicate mm-hmm. this through text. They'll never. Yeah. And it was like the most undetailed text messages. Like I did it on purpose so that I wouldn't get caught. Yeah. And somehow they knew I was buying drugs. Yeah. And they called me. I had just left picking them up. And my mom called me crying and said, I don't know what you just did, Mm. but I know that you're in trouble. So whatever you did, just undo it. Just undo it. I don't want to know what it is. Yeah. I just have a feeling that you are in something that Mm. you do not need to be in. Yeah. And I was just like, how, like what? Yeah. And I was mad. I I mean, I wasn't like, and that's, you know, I'm, I've really drawn this out, but I was drawing up this example yeah for that person that might be in that position in that moment i was not like oh it's god yeah yeah it's god like that was the last thing i was thinking Mm -hmm. but do i think that that 100 percent? like now i think that Mm -hmm. that was god yeah and that's not something that maybe you could see in that moment but where i was at i didn't have the community that would that we've kind of talked about like right. I didn't have anybody speaking into my life I wasn't confessing anything to anybody and if I was that's exactly what somebody would have told me like man don't you see that's the Lord like protecting you right and you just don't even realize it like you don't know what's on the other side of the decisions that you're making yeah and you think that they're fun right now because it's this temporary fulfillment mm-hmm. but it's not it's not eternal fulfillment yeah. like that we can only get from the Lord and there's no one there explaining that to me. Yeah. So, I mean, I just give that example for that person that might be listening and yeah. be in that position. It's just, absolutely, he is there. Yeah. You just have to know how to see it. I love that. That's absolutely true. And, and it, it also makes me think of um, the prodigal son. You know, we talk about the prodigal yeah. son a lot. And um, have you read Tim Keller's Prodigal God? No. Okay, that's your next read. That's your homework okay. after this. Um, in all your spare time that you have uh, yeah. right now. Awesome. Yeah. Um, really good. And he calls it the prodigal God. And I think I'm saying the right title because it's been a little bit since I've read it. Because he says that the, um, I believe that the meaning of prodigal is spendthrift. Well, we see the son take his inheritance early, which is like basically wishing his father dead. He's like, I don't care about your relationship. Mm-hmm. I'm just ready to have what I would receive if you died, you know, and he goes off and he spends it all on lavish living and things that he knows his father would not approve of. 
But then he gets to the point where he's like, man, I'm working on this farm. I have no money. The pigs are eating better than I am. You know, I would I would live better as a hired hand on my father's land. Yeah. You know, so I'm just going to go back and ask to be a servant, like mm-hmm. not to be a son. But he calls it prodigal God because he says it's the father that's the spendthrift. He loves so lavishly, like he he pours out what wasn't earned or deserved yeah. or any of that. Yeah. And not only is he there waiting, not just to take him in as a hard hand, but as a son, but he runs to him, right. you know, Jumps and it's, support. yes, like just runs to him and then throws this lavish party, like mm-hmm. slaughters the fat and calf, like just the favor that we see of the father there. That's like, you know, if you have any question of how the father would view you to go back, like it's that, yeah. like he would love you as a spendthrift, like just, throw all that lavish love on you, you know, and it's, I love that. It's so good. Tim Keller, you know, it's not me. He's brilliant. Um, so what made you, was it that moment that you shared? What, what pushed you to say like, okay, this is not it. Or were you, when you transferred to ULM, were you thinking like, I'm just going to go on living like this? What brought that transition for you? Yeah, it wasn't that moment you would think it would be but it wasn't and then there were even more moments that were even worse ended up going to jail on a beach trip um for over 24 hours and still wasn't it and just more and more until the moment that i decided to initiate transferring to ulm and all that i i was studying for midterms in my second semester of sophomore year so this is like spring Mm -hmm. 2017 and I, from like the binging of, you know, that, mo- that most recent week or so, yeah, it was just so bad that I couldn't retain information as I was sitting there studying. I, mm-hmm. I consciously noticed like, there's just so many substances and, and I'm just so like hung over and, and like Ted that I can't even remember the last thing I read. Yeah. And it was like, I kept like I was studying this material for whatever midterm I had the next day and and I'll try, try again, try again. And I'm like, I can't, I'm not retaining information. I seriously, it was, it was like, this is over hours. Like it was, it was, I was very aware that there was a problem. Like my brain started to not function correctly. Yeah. And for whatever reason, I, I was just tired and, you know, sick and I just got really upset. And then mm-hmm. I think just in that moment, I just had a real, a very real picture of where I was headed. Like, it's like the side of the road. I mean, it's mm-hmm. a homeless addict. I mean, mm-hmm. if I, if this is how I'm start, the symptoms I'm starting to see are real and mm-hmm. they're from my behavior and what I'm putting into my body like this, I'm not going to be in, college much longer like this isn't gonna work right um and right then my grades had started doing bad um even though like there's so many things so many ways to cheat I still was struggling like it was starting to I I couldn't yeah so I just called my mom and uh and even that Reeves was the Lord's protection yeah he like took that ability to function the way you wanted to you know yeah I mean, it, it was, it, it just shocked me. And so I called, it led me to call my mom and I, and I was studying at the fraternity house. It was like pretty late. I think no one was there or awake or whatever, probably studying elsewhere. And I went on the front porch or the front like little courtyard and mm-hmm. sat on a swing and called my mom. And it, I don't fully remember what all I said but it was just like I I can't really go in right now to what I'm like knee deep in over here but I have to leave I know that the only answer now is to leave Mm. and like I think I was pretty apologetic I was just sad I was just like I'm sorry that I've been doing this and I just don't want it I just don't want to live like this anymore and, yeah. I, and I think that the only way is to leave. Yeah. And, well, and like, she was like, I just don't know yeah. what you want me to do. I mean, you can leave. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and so 
I literally pulled out my computer and yeah. requested a transfer on my own. I figured it out. That's like, crazy. Didn't, which was at that moment, like, I just, I'm still kind of shocked that I even knew what to do. Like, I just was right, like, right, the I Lord. Just, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, and just like what that sort of confession, that brokenness on the phone with your mom is like just so clearly depicts like nobody goes out and is like, I think I'm going to walk in a darkness today. Like, I think yeah. I'm just going to go ruin my chances of tomorrow. You know, like nobody, like you said, like it was like, well, either this is just fun right now, you know, and I'm, and eventually it's going to end, you know, or I'm trying to numb something I don't want to think about, but I still want to function the way I want to, fun- you know, and yeah. like, there's always a reason, there's always a reason that we're, and we all numb in different ways. You know, it's not like one person does and another person doesn't, but it's just, you know, it might be watching mindless TV at the end of the day. So you're not processing what bothered you or, you know, yeah. all those things. But, um, but it's like to get down to that, why, why am I doing the patterns that I'm doing? You know, and so like for you to get to that point where it's like, I don't know why I'm doing, you know, like mm-hmm. even that getting to that question is the work of the Lord. Yeah. I think, you know, it's beginning of surrender. So you figure out the transfer and then you were at ULM the next semester. Yeah. I mean, at the end of that one. Yeah. After that day, it, it got worse. I mean, because yeah. at that point I was, I was aware yeah. of my position I'm like you know whether that's with the lord or just in life in general i just was like man i'm screwing this up and so then i really just dove deeper into xanax and drinking and because now you're wanting to know more yeah and it was and like it i kind of just gave up i was just like you know what i mean i'm just gonna move home so yeah. these last couple months are it for the like it, everything i know here yeah. i'm just leaving and i just just planned to never turn back Mm -hmm. but was just kind of wrestling with that and um yeah yeah so i as soon as the school year ended i really just didn't tell anybody i told some of my closest friends there and Mm -hmm. they understood and a couple of them i mean i I talked to one more recently that i wasn't really super close with i wouldn't call like one of my best friends at that time but yeah they all knew like mm-hmm. and and as I've talked to the ones that I've stayed in touch with, it was like not shocking to them. Which yeah. from my end, it was like I don't want to tell anybody. They're just going to be so upset and shocked, and mm-hmm. you know why are you doing that? Or and maybe I was embarrassed that you know to say that I'm mean, you know I'm going to go try to find the Lord and stop yeah. living like this. But yeah, um, they all just they weren't shocked. Yeah, because they were watching me and they were trying. A lot of them were trying to like. Mm. They weren't leading me towards the Lord, but they were like, hey, just this calm down. Yeah. Like, just stop. But I left, like, right after the school year ended, as soon as I could. Moved out of that apartment and just went home. So yeah. I just moved in with my parents. Yeah. And, uh, and was that summer 2017? Yeah. yeah. Like, you finished that semester <clears> and went home, like, May. Um, so when did you start working at Camp Shioka? Yeah, so that's that me. wasn't until I graduated. Okay, so okay. I'm a sophomore at this point. I transferred ahead. to ULM, yeah. and um, I had a I was in construction at LSU, yeah. construction management, and I wanted to continue that. I was yeah. I wanted to do that, and so ULM had a really great construction. I was gonna program. say, yeah, they do. And I didn't even know that switching, right. which again is just the Lord. Um, yeah. But um, so I I came back. And started going to church with my parents, and mm-hmm. and and it was rough. Yeah. I mean, I I was like still drinking every night at the house by myself, like, yeah. and they were just happy that I was home. Yeah. I just um, sat upstairs and watched sports and whatever. Yeah. But I got a job with, you know, this guy that's a contractor that summer, and yeah. I got work to the bone and <laughs> like sun up to sundown and yeah. I really learned how to work. Like, honestly, mm-hmm. I learned that was like the first job that, you know, somebody was really putting the pressure on me and mm-hmm. um, had no idea what I was doing as far as like carpentry. I mean, we were building a house in Mallard Estates and mm-hmm. it was me and two other guys. Yeah. So I had to learn and. You're like, are you sure this is okay? Someone's yeah. going to live in this? You're, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're going to let me do this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so. Yeah, I went to ULM 
and uh yeah. yeah i didn't start working at camp until after i graduated but along the way you know i'm i ended up at ulm i did find that you know the wrong group again and so they're really like i didn't really successfully find like at school in class like the right friends yeah it was more at church with my family like yeah. getting plugged back into the community that we knew before we left before we moved to baton rouge and yeah um because we just from visiting and stuff i knew all these people so right. i just dove back into that community but at school so it's like it's not across the map now it's now in when i'm like i got a school group of people yeah. that aren't that great and now church people again and yeah. And I just wasn't successful at first. I was, I found the wrong group and ended up going out once and uh, just like thinking that I could drink in moderation mm-hmm. and struggled and struggled, struggled with that, but got into addictive study, like a addictive studies counselor. Mm-hmm. Uh, his name is Trent Langhofer. And mm-hmm. that dude, um, like, really. Through through what the Lord did to him, I'm gonna give credit to the Lord. That dude, it's like saved my life. Um, yeah. And partnered with the Holy Spirit, leading him in our conversations. He helped me understand why my brain works the way that it does, and um, yeah, helped me figure out by talking to my parents like what happened in the family line behind me with alcohol and and mm. different things. And so over a gruesome like. 10 months Mm -hmm. i finally figured out i am not meant to be able to handle any alcohol at all i I have to let it go yeah so it was like a it was like i'm mature enough i can handle this i made the responsible decision i left lsu i can drink one or two after work and then you'll get sober and and be like see i can handle it yeah i'll just have one exactly and it just was not working yeah like every month i would just end up having a night where i just got super drunk and so uh around and at the time i'm like finding the lord and finding a relationship with him and uh just having the right people pouring into me Mm -hmm. and i got i ended up I just had one last horrible breaking point. Um, yeah. Tried to drive my car, and someone had to pull me out. And uh, one of my college pastors came mm-hmm. over and just lit into me in a very loving way, but very firm. The way that I, you know, yeah, the firmness that I needed, and yeah. was basically just like get it together. Like this is it. Like yeah. you've you've transferred, and you've. You know, you've made the right steps, but you're not going to bring this heartbreak home mm. and just continue yeah. like this. Yeah. You're not going to do this to your Moving parents locations anymore. locations isn't going to yeah. fix it. Yeah. Like, this has got to be your decision. This has got to be you taking ownership of your relationship with the Lord, and you have yeah. to make changes in your life. Mm-hmm. And uh, I still have a relationship, a very close relationship with them today, but um, that was a that was the moment. A turning that, point, yeah. Um, I got baptized like a week later. I never drank. I have not drank since that day. And I don't know the day, uh, sometime February or March, 2018. So I'm right at six years sober. Well, like that just gives me chill bumps because everyone knows someone who struggles with alcoholism and like, it just feels like such a lost cause. You know, Mm -hmm. you can feel like a broken record loving that person or they've relapsed again it's heavy it's hard you know um you know tim keller again um you know he talked about like the person without self-control yes hurts them but like sometimes hurts the people next to them even more Mm -hmm. you know because you're having to watch it um and you don't have any control over it but like the fact that that you attribute that conversation like your life changing to that conversation is like yes like keep loving those people keep reaching out Mm -hmm. following the spirit because you never know what will be the turning point for them you know like and that's so powerful to me because it does i mean i'm sure you've experienced it too now just like you feel like uh, like what am i going to say that's going to change anything you know yeah but you just never know well it's not that's the thing yeah because if you just think about that conversation it's just you're it's all 
at least for me, knowing, you know, my story back and forth, because it's my story and, you know, I, yeah. I did it. Um, I feel like if you listen to that, though, you're like, that was it. Like that conversation. Like, yeah. how is that what got you and not going to jail or mm-hmm. your mom calling you while you're about to sell drugs? Random, like just off a of feeling like. Yeah. Or all the, you know, yeah. sadness, depression, like a gazillion things. Um, so it's not, it's, it wasn't him, it was the Lord, you know. It was right, the, right. It was the timing. It was the way the Lord had prepared my heart for that moment. And I was actually able to receive what he was saying. And that guy just showed up, you know. And mm. it's kind of to what you're saying. I think it's important to keep showing up. and Yeah. Um, you never know what the Lord's going to move through. Yeah. And I like to, because I feel like you have these, like, two seasons kind of side by side you have the one in LSU where you're like totally removed from your family and then your friends here that you knew were walking with the Lord Mm -hmm. and then you move here and you're like I'd like to say I just jumped right into with the people that I knew were walking the right way but I didn't but like we can see the truth so clearly in your story that it's not it wasn't the absence of darkness that changed your life it was the presence of light you know like that's good that's all of our stories, mm-hmm. you know, like we're not going to, we're not going to save ourselves by removing sin. Like we have to have the light on our lives in order to be transformed. You yeah. Know? Um, I love that. Thank you for sharing that with us. So following that moment, what did it look like for you to pursue that for yourself? Well, I was, you know, initially like everybody is just like, you're like high on it. Um, yeah, I got baptized by to I had like at the time we had this crazy college ministry it was like very house church form um mm-hmm. I still don't think I've been a part of something so special mm-hmm. and the timing that I came here to be a part of that it was just crucial for yeah um that season and uh so like two of the five or six college pastors it was like three or four couples mm-hmm. um running it but they baptized me and um One of them was the worship leader at WFR, which, Mm -hmm. you know, WFR was a church of Christ, but they have, they've become a non-denominational church. So they have like a traditional service and a Mm -hmm. uh, contemporary service. Yeah. And my mom played keys with that band and, Mm -hmm. and background, my whole fam, like my whole mom's side of the family is super musical. Mm -hmm. Um, like made like piano on my through my mom and and my grandmother my grandmother taught faith hill fun fact That's how to play awesome. piano when That's she was like awesome. a teenager yeah um and then my grandfather was like a pan director and crazy outdoorsman he did like he just did everything uh, yeah but the music was all up in it and uh I grew up in it and I hated it from when, like when I was a kid. I just, <laughs> I just did. And, and my, like I was forced to play piano, like mm-hmm. lessons, like private lessons, like yeah, hated it. And, but some, for whatever reason, cause it was a free period, did choir in high school mm-hmm. for four years. Yeah. And just, you know, I was messing around in there. It didn't really take it seriously, but I learned so much looking back like that I carry with me today. It's crazy. But yeah. so I just was really immersed against my will into music. My mom's playing at the church and um, that guy, his name's Ryan Lee and still very involved in this community. And uh, he just took me under his wing and threw me in there and, and really got me to jump on a guitar and learn how to play and eventually you hadn't played the guitar before. no i had not i didn't know how to play guitar Uh, i wanted to yeah like i say i wanted to but but making that whole life change i finally like embraced music and i just Mm kind of was like you know my stepdad loves playing guitar he gave me this like old taylor and so i had it in my house and i just started playing and the stuff that i knew from piano and music theory i just applied it but Mm -hmm. watched watched some videos and, and just watched Ryan lead yeah. and just had tons of conversations with him and just put it all together. And yeah. And eventually that's crazy. Learn how to play guitar. And so started leading at WFR. Yeah. And then ended up graduating, you know, that's kind of happened at the same time, graduated mm-hmm. in December, 2019. And 
at some point in there, I think it was 2019, I switched to a church called Christ Church, which <clears throat> I just had found a ton of community there and like mm-hmm. community for my age and the people I was around, like people kind of moved and yeah. at WFR I just didn't have the community that I felt like I wanted. And, right. and I had already started building this community at Christ Church. Yeah. Well, I had been working through that last year of college. I start, that was when I started working at camp. Yeah. So I lied earlier. I, I didn't start working there full time until after I graduated. Gotcha. But I've been working by the hour. Yeah. So I was working these retreats with like Christchurch people. Like yeah. just like I think North Monroe had started doing some stuff out there. Like it was like mm-hmm. every every church in the area. Right. I started meeting all these people and ended up going to Christchurch and and they are just they've just been doing a contemporary type service a lot right. longer because really i think they used to be long ago they were pentecostal mm-hmm. but they're non-denominational and right. so it was just like i learned so it was just a completely different yeah. perspective that i got to experience and mm-hmm. had more mentors there like ty shari and and just got immersed over into community over there and um when i started working at camp full-time john luke you know that that was very tied in with WFR long ago, and yeah. um, so it's like Church of Christ roots at that camp. Right. Well, John Luke became the director. Yeah. Like the year before, I ended up working there full time. Okay. Which, I didn't say this before, but when we were kids, that was something we talked about doing because we went to camp every wow. year. It was like something we joked about. Yeah. And like just pipe dream type thing. Yeah. So now we're working there, and he's like, "Hey, you've been leading at WFR. Now you're leading at Christ Church. Like, like." Or it was before I left to go to Christ Church. But either way, mm-hmm. he's like, let's start doing instrumental worship. Because that had never been done before. Right. At camp. And so I was like, okay. And just based off everything that Ryan had taught me and what I would learned, I put a team together through the summer counselors. And mm-hmm. we got the equipment that we needed. And, and so I started this like worship program at yeah. Camp Chioka. And then... Ended up doing that for the whole time that I was working at camp, which that didn't end until this past fall. So yeah. 2019 to 2023, about okay. four years. Yeah. And <clears throat> so somewhere along the way, I was doing all that and just started leading worship all the time. Mm-hmm. And I entered this season where I just said yes to everything. I was like single, working and living at Camp Chioka like just yeah it was just I was just on fire like yeah and I just had the season where I had the ability to just be a complete yes man yeah so I was leading at all kinds of stuff like yeah it was crazy I had something like every night yeah and I just learned so much and I just like I grew in my faith and like into what I've ended up really finding out like I was understanding that the Lord had like called me to lead like in these capacities, but yeah, like working at camp and just doing like being completely satisfied, like walking with the Lord and doing these small things, which at the time they weren't small to me that I didn't care. Mm -hmm. I just was enjoying it. Right. I ended up, you know, having these conversations with Sadie who was like, I want to start this like worship like label pretty much i mean yeah it's complicated how all that works but essentially i mean you can call it that yeah and she was like what is your interest in doing this and so i was absolutely excited like yeah i didn't even believe it um but i kind of lost my train of thought but that that so that's how that came along led into that yeah and i just the Lord prepared me in all of that, like years of just like one thing after another, like, I mean, really just like acoustic, Mm -hmm. like not really full band stuff. Like I just, yeah, just led and led and led and led and led, just like learned how to lead in all kinds of circumstances and lead people and just worship. That's so cool. And like, it doesn't matter that I'm on this stage or whatever. All I have Mm -hmm. to do is worship and, and, and be attentive to what's happening in the room. And, well, it's yeah. cool to me. It's making me um, think of like Saul to Paul because, you know, if anyone's familiar with Paul's testimony, like he was like zealously like 
persecuting the church, you yeah. know, until Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and was like, no, like, why are you persecuting me? You know, like, and changed his life. And Paul walked, but he, he took someone who was already zealous and he was like, <clears throat> I'm going to use that to build my church, yeah. you know? And it's like, it sounds like in your darkest time, like even your friends who weren't necessarily walking with the Lord were looking at you being like, Reeves, that's too much. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you're all in, like you, you can't, can't jump in that far. But then like he also took that same personality and was like, all right, I'm going to immerse you into this worship, you know? Yeah. And it's like how cool that is to see, you know, it's like, yeah, you have this thread of alcoholism in your family, but you also have this thread of music that I'm about to use for the kingdom, you know? Yeah. And so that's just really cool to see. Um, and I want to hear more about Elo worship. But I know that you also said, like, in that season of Camp Chioka, while all that's unfolding and you're working there, that you began to hear the voice of the Lord more clearly and yeah. personally, and also that the story of David, like, yeah. you really connect with your story there. Yeah, the it was like, you know, probably a year or two into working at camp. My job at camp was, like, I did the worship program, but that was really just in the summer. And so what I grew into was this position of um, booking rentals mm -hmm. in the off season, which is just ended up looking like a retreat from any given church that wants to come out to camp and, you know, youth retreats, men's retreats, women's right. retreats. Um, and so we, uh, so I, I, that was my like main responsibility throughout the year. And then mm -hmm. I would do, I would kind of, like the whole time year round I'm, I'm groundskeeper like mm -hmm. mowing the grass just taking care of the property and but that entailed cleaning like every square inch of the camp yeah and yeah. so they're like at the time i remember there was like 17 buildings that i could and that Louis i had like, to maintain you, now there's like 25 buildings i mean wow. it's like we do all kinds of projects out there and it's just like it just keeps growing but yeah at the time it started out i mean even at the beginning it was just like 17 buildings like sleeping areas gym mess hall mm -hmm. kitchen like all kinds of commercial um kitchen appliances utensils like right a laundry room laundry everywhere constantly from groups coming in <laughs> yeah. like I was a glorified janitor, like, yeah. and I don't say that negatively, like, I was so game, I was just like, let's yeah. go, like, let's do it, Yeah. and I mean, it's 100 acres, I live out there, I'm just working out there, and so yeah. through that, um, I just, I just, literally, day to day, I just worship, like, listen to worship music mm -hmm. in headphones, Yeah. and clean that place, yeah. Every, every day yeah like and, and if i'm not doing that i'm on the grass yeah. or learning how to clean the pool and mm -hmm. like just meeting needs whatever yeah, yeah. So, like and when groups are coming out serving the people right like I, the, my 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 role was just figuring out what they needed and helping yeah. them set up for to use our space and yeah and so through that i'm like I just ended up talking to the Lord like all day, every day. Yeah. And it was like crazy. It was crazy, honestly. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I could have experienced that in any other way. Yeah. Um, any other job. Like, I'd, like while you're busy with your hands, just be with me. Literally. Yeah. I, I had no option. What else right. was I going to do? And, you know, mm -hmm. I just started leading worship. I'm obsessed with like this genre of worship music I'd never dove into before. So I have so much to discover. And like, yeah. I've always loved music. I'm, I, I said earlier, I hated playing it. Right, I, right. I've always loved music. I've just analyzed it and yeah. loved all kinds of music. So like, I just was constantly in the presence of the Lord. Yeah. And that's the place where I was encountering the Lord in the midst of all of that. So I right. was back at the place where the Lord was initially meeting me. Yeah. And remembering all these things like mm. I'm mowing the grass in this field where I remember on my knees just crying because mm. I didn't know what to do. Like and I was yeah. encountering the Lord but didn't know what that meant for my life. Like and now mm. I'm on the other side of that, like working at this place full time. I uh, started leading worship. I'm happy. I found like joy, yeah. not just this emotion of like what everyone says they want in life, like to be happy. Like, yeah, I found peace and joy. Yeah. Um, 
And so that was like what day to day I did. Yeah. And so I grew tremendously fast. Like I just mm-hmm. like, I don't know. I just found this super deep intentional relationship with the Lord yeah. where it was like, it's, it's hard to like yeah. be at where I was then. Like even mm-hmm. now, like I will say like I've grown and matured over, over time and I'm in a different season now, but like where my relationship was with the Lord then is like, mm-hmm. it's so hard to get back, get it back. Well, which is so pretty much... discouraging sometimes. <laughs> like, I'm like, I don't know how to set up my situation yeah. where I can just, all I do is I know. be in your presence. <laughs> I know, yeah. Well, and I'm sure that led straight into some of your songwriting that we'll get yeah. to. But, but, you know, like, I, I think so many people can relate to that, whether it was the beginning of their relationship with the Lord or whatever that looks like. But it's because it's like with busyness, there's so much room for distraction. Mm-hmm. And it's like you there's not as much time to sit and behold, you know, like you do no. wish you could just sit there. Um, and I can see too where David's like story relates because you know, you're, you're out, out in the fields, you yeah. know, like, but he's, he's preparing you and like shaping you as you're being with him out in the fields for like what was to come, you know? Yeah. So there's even more to that and it's crazy. Yeah. And, but that eventually started to have its, like I had struggles with what was like my environment. So like, yeah. if you think about it, I'm really isolated. Right. And so like at first mm-hmm. in like the beginning of my walk with Christ, like it's the best thing ever. Like yeah. I found this joy and peace and all this, but over, still not good for man to be alone. Yeah. Yeah. And after a while, I'm literally like the only one out there mm-hmm. and I really don't have anybody even checking on me. I'm working off of like integrity and, and, Mm -hmm. and, and it's just like, I I don't have anybody there. Like, it's just the way that the camp season works. Everybody comes around for the summer, but like no one's like really hands on full time in the off season besides me. Like Mm -hmm. it's a nonprofit organization. We're not paying all these employees. Like, right. There was enough for like one person to do that. And so. I started really struggling, like, I was talking to the Lord, like, every day, like, before, and and was just continuing to walk with Him and and doing my responsibilities, but I started struggling with just, like, you know, is there more for me than just this, and, and, you Mm -hmm. know, like, things with LO were super cool, but they, it's not as fast as you would like, like mm-hmm. it's not like a dream. Like it takes work. Like it's hard to write. I thought people don't see that. Yeah, I thought I was going to be like good at it and I'm, I don't feel like I am. Yeah. And, well, you are. I appreciate that. But like, it's just, it started, I started facing real challenges and, yeah. and I started just having a lot of internal struggles as I'm walking around cleaning this place every single mm-hmm. day. Like, and then I was wrestling with, I'm too good for this. Like, mm-hmm. I'm better than this. And, you know, I just battled with the wrong attitude mm-hmm. on a lot of days. And yeah, I started to lose my gratefulness for just getting to be out there with him that I had in the mm-hmm. beginning. Yeah. And um, I, so this is crazy. So... I started reading this like super deep study and following the super deep study on David. Mm -hmm. And like, so from like shepherd to serving the king, like went in super deep. And some things that I learned were like a shepherd and sheep, like in that time and what the Bible is like referencing when it's talking about like the sheep know the shepherd's voice. Right. That's literal. So like, when maybe still to this day, I don't know, but shepherds in that time, like they knew their shepherd's voice. So lots of groups of sheep were kept in the same field together. So it's like, there's this shepherd sheep in this field and these two other shepherds, other groups of sheep that aren't, yeah, you know, this guy owns these, this guy, and they're all in the same pasture. Yeah. Let's just say when they would come to move them and count them and got what, you know, the things that a shepherd entails, he would call them and just his sheep would come, not the others. Yeah. And I just, I just didn't know that. And I yeah. was just like, crazy. Wait. 
And so all these analogies of like the lost sheep and like God, like as our shepherd and we're the sheep, like just came to life. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, oh my gosh. Well, like unrelated, but super related. (laughs) (laughs) We, this guy that his kids grew up coming to camp, whatever. Like, he's like, I have these ducks. I'm going to bring them out to camp. And John Luke is like an animal machine. Like (laughs) he is obsessed with animals. So he's like, yes. And I'm like, this means I have to take care of the animals. (laughs) Cause we've done like Guinea pit, uh, uh, Guinea fowl. Oh yeah. Uh, they all were hunted and killed by coyotes. I tried to defend them. Yeah. Anybody with chickens gets that. I raised them and then lost them one day at a time, like battling, like, like all the, we, we, we caught, a um, peacock. Yeah. On Brownlee Road (laughs) and released it at camp (laughs) and had that as a camp pet when it ran off. Somebody on like Arkansas Road owns it and they, they got it back. I probably but, took it from them. But yeah. <laughs> and so like we've had these animals. So I'm like, great. Give me more animals. That's what I need. Just yeah. something else to do. And I'm wrestling with this bad attitude. Yeah. Well, these ducks, the wings were clipped. They lived in the pond. And, and there were some local wood ducks too that would always come to the pond. So I had like this time sometimes when I found a moment, I would go down to the pond and see if the wood ducks are there because they're just... If you don't know about a wood duck, they're just one of the most beautiful ducks to me. They're everywhere in, in West Monroe. Yeah. I didn't grow up here, so yeah, that was like, I loved wood ducks, still do. Yeah. And so I go down there. Well, now we have these 10 mallards. Yeah. And so I, I start feeding them. So I'm like, I start like getting super interested in, interested in this stuff. Yeah. So I buy a feeder that's going to automatically feed. Mm-hmm. Well, the I you have to. It just, in the weather, it just got torn up and it just would get clogged with the food for them. And so, long story short, I start feeding them yeah. by throwing out the food. Yeah. Because I was just like, when I had a free moment, I just needed a break from cleaning. I was right. just, like, just going to go down the lake. And, you know, I was trying to have what I had at the beginning. Like, I'm going to go and just take a moment and just pray and, like, kind of mm-hmm. just be by the lake and feed these ducks. Yeah. Well, as I... F- started to feed them they started to come closer and then it was crazy over yeah. time they I, I would come down and i would talk to them to try to get them to come from whatever it's like a two acre pond that could be on the other side when i come right. down there i would just talk yeah or or i would ride up on the buggy they would hear the buggy or they would hear my voice if i walked down there yeah and they would come like zooming they can't fly but they can like go on top of the water they would zoom over to me yeah and come and eat out of my hand yeah and they knew my voice yeah it's crazy and i just it was like i i don't even know how to tell the story and give it justice like yeah the fact that i was reading that yeah and all these things i was struggling with and he's showing you so clearly. And what it that was looks like, like, yeah, I was experiencing it. Yeah. Like, and it was just, I, I can't even, ex- I can't explain yeah. it. It was just like, <laughs> just an experience. I just didn't know if I was supposed to keep working at camp and yeah. is, you know, am I going to work for LO full time? Am I yeah. gonna, like, what am I going to do? And, yeah. Um, I think I'm still like kind of figuring that out <laughs> yeah. day by day, but like, yeah. Um, I said at the beginning, like now I have a lawn business and I'm in real estate and I'm still doing all this stuff. Um, and we're just really building something with all of that. Um, so it's not really like something I do full time. It's like something that the Lord's called me to and I, and it requires patience and hard, hard work and, and focus and, and time and relationship with the Lord to like overflow into that. And so that was like a huge moment for me learning. Mm. Okay. It doesn't really matter. Like sometimes the Lord will make it very clear where he wants you to work. What these big questions that we have coming out. Right. Of, where am I going to go to college? Who am I going to marry? That's a huge one Yeah, that I was wrestling with. Yeah. Like what's the answer? Yeah. And the answer is it's, I mean, you know, it's like what I learned with those ducks. It's just like, learn to hear my voice yeah. and listen to it 
and keep it with you wherever you go. Like yeah. I will bring you what like, you need and share it with others. And yeah, and I'll have everything that you need. And yeah, and so I like really struggled with do I leave camp or do I stay here? You know, yeah. I got I got married along the way. Or, yes, and I met this girl at camp, Lydia, and <laughs> at a retreat for Christchurch, but it was at camp. So yeah, and then. It was just funny. I mean, I liked her for a year. She didn't like me. She told me no. And, but then she said no, and I was like, all right, fine. But we she didn't know how to... determined Reeves Walker was. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, she learned that and then was like, okay, that's enough. Whatever. I, I just want to be friends. And I'm like, okay, well, we can, you, we can see how that goes. <laughs> but at some point, like friends between a guy and a girl that aren't dating is, has some ultimate end. Yeah. You're gonna find somebody, or I will, and I told her this, and then that's not gonna be okay. Like yeah. whatever I find, it's not gonna be cool with me being best friends with you. Yeah. So that's fine. We can be friends. I just needed. We just needed to. Yeah. Define that. Well, she came back like six months later and was like, "I was wrong," and because we had just, we, I put a lot of separation between us. I was like, "I need space." Mm-hmm. If that's, yeah. And she came and worked at camp that summer, and and uh, we got married and. 2022 so that's awesome i love lydia so much yeah and so it was like that and now i ended up leaving camp and i was struggling with that and and i was getting married and i i just i just needed to it was time for the next thing yeah but it was a gruesome process Mm -hmm. to get me to figure that out like it was like am i doing the wrong yeah what do i do do i stay do i have faith or do i like have courage and go like yeah. I, I just I was like what do you want me to do but he was not going to tell me yeah audibly and I'm not saying that God doesn't speak to people like that and and, and has before I'm just saying he didn't for me in yeah. that moment specifically and I think that's important you know, to hear because it's like he doesn't speak to every person the same way yeah I don't think so and to the same person he doesn't speak in the same way every season mm-hmm. you know like there are times where he's like made me step out in faith before he gave an answer, you know, or like confirmed it. Like, yes, this door opened, you know, when you stepped out because you have to trust me or whatever, you know, or closed a door. Um, But yeah, I I, I love that perspective. And just, um, I think like, I love that at the beginning of that, it was like just this deep contentment in the Lord's presence. But I think also sometimes he does place this discontentment in us to use because like, you would have stayed, you would have wanted to stay there forever. And it's right. like he had other things. It's like, this is great. You yes. know, we're just yeah. like, I can sit here and be yeah. with you. But like, at some point, and that was it. That was the Lord, like, this is over. Yeah. You don't get to just stay here and enjoy. Like, you're going to go and do other yeah. things now, and you're going to take that with you. Right. You get to take his presence with and you. You're going to learn how to carry the these things that you've learned and yeah. how to walk with me in yeah. other places because a life with Christ doesn't mean like sharing the gospel in a life with Christ doesn't mean drop everything and do ministry for some people it does right and that's something that I struggled with at one point and and did kind of right like I ended up going that route in yeah. a way at camp and but I think a lot of people especially coming out of college like walking with Christ they're like oh I guess I'm going to go into ministry that's not necessarily the answer that you need. It doesn't have to be vocational ministry for you to be doing ministry everywhere you go. You know what we need? We need people that want to do ministry in non-ministerial areas. We need people doing ministry in the corporate world. And somebody is struggling. You you get to witness to them. You know, like you're in places. I can show the love of Christ wherever I'm at. Yeah. And so, like, we actually need more of the latter. Like, we don't yeah. need more people necessarily. I'm not yeah. saying anything definitively. But, <laughs> All right, um, I quit. The salt works is over. <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. It's some people, it is, but like, I think some people get caught up on that. Absolutely. And I did. And yeah. I did. And yeah. it's like, no, I can do ministry. Yes. On a volunteer basis. And, right. And I can work this job and bring ministry into that too and so I yeah don't know, there's just absolutely it's not holier work yeah you know what I mean just because it's vocational ministry mm-hmm. you know and like that's so true and that's so important you know 
Um, well, okay, I don't want to keep you forever, but I want to ask, you know, about LO Worship. How is it going? Like, what's the next thing? Can yeah, you tell it's, us? Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, the next thing thing is LO conference yeah right? every so LO conference every year yeah um, and we have been we've had three technically yeah that we had the first one at Christ Church I wasn't at that one mm-hmm. and had the stomach bug and so then we've had in the consecutive years we've had two at the Civic Center here in Monroe mm-hmm. and so the next one's coming up and it's in September I can't remember the date first weekend September. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, but we've been dropping music the yeah. week before every year. And I guess I'll just say we're doing that and more. So awesome. we are doing so some exciting. stuff a little bit earlier than conference. So okay. that's all an right. exciting thing. That to is be really for. exciting. Yeah. We all always do such a great job. I love, Thanks. I love our worship. So we're excited about that. Yeah. Yeah, we've just been we've been riding a lot, and um, we're starting to like try to figure out, you know, how can we go and lead these songs in more places than right. conference, and you right. know, the things that we have locally here. Yeah. Um, but like I said earlier, we're really just trying to go at the pace that the Lord wants us to go at. Right. And at least for me, and I know for other people on the team as well, that's definitely slower than what you would think going into it right. all excited like let's yeah. do this like let's write a hundred songs like yeah. one it's not that easy two it's a, it's just there's a lot that goes into it and so yeah um yeah we're just going at the pace that the lord wants us to go at and Absolutely. we're all learning how to really just walk with christ in every aspect of our life and right because I think that we're constantly learning that. Yeah. So that's absolutely. my big thing right now. A big book I'm reading, you talked about a book earlier, Yeah. <clears throat> is Practicing the Way, which Andrew said he's reading. Yes, I've started it, but I'm, it is like I'm a un- serial book starter. Be- like, yeah, <laughs> same. Yeah. This no one, you, there's the book every now and then, though, tell me, that you do finish and you'll yeah, read yeah. again yeah. because it's awesome. Okay, yeah. this is a book I'm almost done with the second time through in wow. like a month. And it's so good. It is unbelievable. Yeah. I know people that I look up to talk about these books that they read every year, like just, yeah. you know, different theologians, whoever. And like, this is the first book I've read that I'm like, I need to read this every year, every yes. month if I can. Like, it's just so good. It for is. Just how to conceptualize, like, what does a walk with Christ look like in yes. any situation? I don't know. It's just really. Yes. Uh, it's, practical. he does such a good job of being like, Yes, a disciple is a learner, but it's someone in that time, the disciple was an apprentice. Yeah. Like, it's hands-on work. It's like, do what I do. Right. You know, like, and yeah, it's really good. Yeah. I'm excited to finish it. So, okay, that, all right, you have your homework, and now I have mine. Yeah. I'll finish that book. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, thank you so much, Reeves. Yeah. It, it means a lot. I know that all that's not easy to share, but it's really powerful, and um, we really appreciate you sharing with us. Yeah, I love sharing it. You know, I, I'm obviously super grateful for what the Lord brought me through, even as hard as some of it was. And um, yeah. I know that I'm called to tell that to people not to put my sin on display and say, look how bad I was or how awesome it is that I did all these crazy things at all. Not at all. No, it, w- it more, wasn't that way yeah, at all. I know that the Lord calls me to share that for people that are there and, and don't know it might end up there. And, right. um, you know, maybe hopefully those listening might see how I was able to find the Lord through that and be There's able to do hope. it even better and faster than I did. If you yeah. find yourself there, you know? Yeah, yeah, but. absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's very powerful. And thank y'all so much for listening into the salt works and we'll see you next week. is my story This is your story